are back again with Paul. Thanks so much for coming back there in Britain, there in London. Uh, so nice to have you on board. We have, uh, you have probably been watching that uh, for the videos that Mel and I have done since you came on that introduce this whole Jerusalem thesis. We're playing off of that Jerusalem thesis. And that's why I wanted to bring you back again, because you've got some more material that's going to not only uh, embellish what Mel has said, but also help us to follow through. Where is that Islam is going to? Where are, where are they looking to, to create not only their theology, but also their history? And as we're finding out, an awful lot of it is borrowed from Judaism, and more specifically, borrowed from Jerusalem and its environment. So let's go ahead. You've got three categories that you're going to be introducing. And what we're going to do, Paul, uh, we're going to do each one as a standalone, if you don't mind, because mm -hmm. I think yep. each one of them needs to be discussed as a uh, one by one by one, because there, there's there's enough information, and we would like to see what the comments are at the bottom. So people who are watching, uh, Christians or Jews or uh, Muslims, or even those who have no real uh, take on this, can you at least hear, hear what we're, uh, what's being said and then respond to it? We'd like to hear your response. There's been some great responses. Paul, have you looked at the comments from the last time we, we talked last week? I have done that. First of all, thank you very much for having me back, Jay. Yes, there's been a very, very high standard of debate um, and discussion. Lots of people with new new uh, ideas and, uh, and new suggestions. It's taking a lot of time. I try to apply to as many as I, as I can. It's been fascinating. So these are green papers that we're putting out there. These are ideas that we're coming up with. These are suppositions that's nothing more these are nothing more than suppositions but we want to see how you react to it we want to see where this goes as we're you're finding paul and mel and and murad and joe and the others they're coming up with so much new material we we want to make sure that you all see it and uh, uh, not only try to engage with it but as we unpack it respond to it okay over to you what is it the theme and i think we're going to talk about the Nazarites, aren't we? This is the first one. So, right to you. Uh, let's uh, go up and put your okay. Did, up and did, I, I shall share. Did, did you want me to quickly go through um, for anyone who's just joining us for the first time? Please do. Why don't you give us a review? Start with that because that will. There will be people who haven't don't know who you are. And I'll, while you're going up and bringing up this uh, share screen, I'm just going to introduce you to those who are new to you. Paul is new to me as well, so I'm just getting to know him. I've only known him for about maybe one or two weeks. But he has been working for the last three years on this material, and he has dedicated himself to really kind of, uh, unpack it, to research it, come to conclusions on it. And uh, he now has put it on to PowerPoints. I think you've probably got the best PowerPoints I've seen out there. And you say the reason for that is because you used to be a, a teacher. You have students. That's right. PowerPoint. You're Mr. PowerPoint. But you're very colorful PowerPoints. We're going to be uh, blessed with that in just a few moments. So over to you, Paul, as you now bring up your PowerPoint. Okay, you, you are complimenting me, Jay, on, on the PowerPoints. And normally I like to have... Um, large fonts and spread the information out and use colors and illustrations um, and make it all really clear. But one problem with the Jerusalem thesis is there's simply so much information there. It's very difficult to put it all on the page. Uh, here you see in the uh, left-hand column are the attributes that the Quran tells us about the place it calls the Masjid al-Haram, the sacred place of worship. And and you will see how in each instance it's all uh, it, it can all be satisfied or can all be related to either the, the site of the Jerusalem temple or, or to the Jerusalem temple itself. So, for example, the Quran tells us that the Masjid al-Haram is God's house. It talks in the divine voice, uh, refers to it as my house. Well, the temple is called God's house right the way through the Bible, dozens and dozens of, uh, of verses refer to the Jerusalem temple as the house of God in both the Old and the New Testament. The Quran tells us that the, um, the, the, the uh, Masjid al-Haram uh, is connected to the, or is the first house at Baca. And we've seen that Baca is a refreshment stop on the pilgrimage route to Jerusalem in Psalm 84. We've seen that the Quran calls the uh, Masjid al-Haram the Kaaba, the cube. 
and the Holy of Holies of the temples is clearly described as a cube in uh, 1 Kings uh, chapter 6, verse 20. Uh, it wouldn't have looked like a cube on the outside, but it's a cubic room if you're inside it. It's 20 cubits by 20 cubits by 20 cubits. The Quran tells us that this place was assigned by God for Abraham, that the foundations had been raised by Abraham and by Ishmael, and that Abraham had settled his progeny nearby. Well, again, with the temple, we see that it was uh, built, or reputedly built on Mount Moriah, which had been appointed by God as a place upon which Abraham was to sacrifice Isaac. So God points out the mountain where he wants Abraham to do this. So it was exactly a house, uh, a place assigned by God for Abraham. Uh, God built, uh, Abraham built uh, an altar there. And, and then it talks about Abraham settling his progeny nearby. Well, of course, Jerusalem is the capital of several Jewish nations that have existed throughout history since, um, since the, uh, the Jews entered into the Promised Land. The Quran tells us that it's the destination of the Hajj pilgrimage. And uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 16, there are three feasts that the, uh, that the Torah tells us must be held at the temple. Um, and these are described as Hag feasts. And of course, if the feast has to be held at the temple, then people have to go there if they're not already there. So that must involve a pilgrimage. The transfer of the sound from a, uh, a hard G, the, the, the Hebrew letter Gimel, um, to the soft J, as in moving from Hag to Hajj, uh, is, is quite normal when Hebrew words are, um, are adopted in, in Arabic. So, for example, we talk about the angel Gabriel um, in, in Hebrew, but it becomes Jabril when it's in Arabic. And uh, the valley of Gehenna becomes Jahannam. So there is it's quite nothing to be surprised about that the Hebrew word Hag becomes Hajj. Um, the Quran tells us that there must be an animal sacrifice as part of this Hajj pilgrimage. And animals were sacrificed uh, in the celebration of the Passover, which is one of the three feasts celebrated at the temple. It also talks about circumambulation and um, two of the three feasts involve circumambulation. Um, the Feast of Weeks, um, which are the, the sort of harvest feast, involves going around an altar seven times according to the, uh, or on seven consecutive days, and then seven times on the last day according to the Mishnah, the Jewish oral law. And according to the Book of Jubilees, which is which is very old, possibly as old as Genesis itself, um, the Feast of Tabernacles um, was first celebrated by Abraham by walking around his altar on uh, seven consecutive days. The Quran tells us that one must go between Safa and Marwa whilst on this pilgrimage. Well, Mawa is, is very similar to uh, Mount Moriah, which is where Abraham was about to conduct the sacrifice and, and, uh, and kill Isaac. And Safa is uh, a, an archaic name for Mount Scopus, which is, uh, uh, which is a, a, a hill which is adjacent to Mount Moriah in the Jerusalem landscape. So you can see that virtually every single attribute that the Quran tells us about the Masjid al-Haram is in fact can be, be directly related to the Jerusalem temple either through the Bible itself or through other pre-Islamic texts. Now you see there are two that I haven't linked and I'm going to look at one of these today if I may. Uh, this is the shaving of one's head. The Quran tells us that um, shaving of one's head is part of this pilgrimage. Uh, Mel has has addressed this in one video. I'd like to go and see if I can uh, push the uh, push the uh, investigation a little bit further.
Well, in the book of Numbers, chapter 6, verses 1 to 5, uh, there is a provision for something called the Nazarite vow. Uh, the Nazarite means to be separated, or to a, a, a separate person, or a person who's undergoing some sort of separation. And it seems to be a vow that allows Hebrews, who are not part of the Levite tribe, to dedicate their lives to God uh, for a finite period of time. So in the Nazarite vow, the book of Numbers states, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and tell them, when a man or a woman solemnly takes the Nazarite vow to dedicate himself to God or to dedicate himself to the Lord, he shall abstain from wine and strong drink. He may neither drink wine vinegar, other vinegar, or any kind of grape juice, nor eat either fresh or dried grapes. As long as he is a Nazarite, he shall not eat anything of the produce of the vine, nor even unripe grapes or grape skins. While he is under the Nazarite vow, no razor shall touch his hair until the period of his dedication to the Lord is over. He shall be sacred and shall let the hair of his head grow freely. And uh, I'm sure the most uh, famous Nazarite uh, popularly is, the, is Samson, who famously couldn't uh, or, or, or vowed not to cut his hair. And, and then Delilah went and took, cut his hair for him and, uh, and, and took away his strength. Verse 18 allows for the Nazarite vow to come to an end. And when the, and when the person's period of separation and period of uh, specific dedication to God comes to an end, there is a procedure to be adopted. And this reads, then at the entrance of the meeting tent, the Nazarite shall shave his dedicated head, collect the hair, and put it in the fire that is under the peace offering. So the Nazarite, to bring the vow to an end, has to shave his hair and then put all the hair as part of the offering. It seems to me, although the Book of Numbers doesn't say so explicitly, it seems to me likely that that involves uh, not only shaving your hair at the end of the Nazarite vow, but also shaving your hair at the beginning of the vow so that you will know exactly how much hair had grown during the period of dedication. And you will also notice, because it shall become relevant, um, that it requires that one abstain from wine and strong drink. Well, there's an interesting um, detail. St. Paul is said to have shaved his hair in the uh, Acts of the Apostles, in chapter 18, verse 18, uh, it says, uh, Paul, he's, I think he's in Corinth at this stage, uh, and he took his leave of his brothers and sailed for Syria in the company of Priscilla and Aquila. At the port of Kentri, uh, he shaved his head because of a vow that he had taken. Uh, St. Luke doesn't explain um, which what vow it was or, or, or why he was shaving his vow but it seems likely to me um, and indeed to most commentators that Paul was had either taken the Nazarite vow and was growing his hair in particular or that he, or that he was uh, had adopted it in some way in some personal way because he was drawing upon this tradition well let's have a look at what the Quran says in Surah 2, verse 196, it uh, says, do not shave your heads until the offering reaches the place of sacrifice. So that sounds somewhat similar to the uh, ritual for concluding the Nazarite vow, because that requires going to a specific place, in that case, the entrance to the meeting tent, although in later, in later that would become the temple. And it also talks about a peace offering. So... Um, so it has the idea of an offering and a place of offering and says, do not shave your head until you get there. So it seems to be a, an echo there in Surah 2, 196 to Numbers 6, 1 to 5. In Surah 48, verses, uh, verse 27, it states, you shall enter the Masjid al-Haram in security if God wills. 
with the hair of your heads shaven or cut. Now, Sura 48 is called the victory, and, uh, and it is uh, about a, a treaty that has been made between the Quranic community and a group of uh, unbelievers. Uh, Sura 48 talks um, about uh, God has withheld their hands from you and your hands from them. So it looks as though a peace treaty has been agreed, which the Quran author is presenting as some sort of great triumph and great victory. Uh, within that context, uh, he's then promising them that this will lead the way to, um, to, to advance their cause and getting to the Masjid al-Haram. And then it promises that when they get there, uh, you will enter it uh, with the hair of your heads shaven or cut. So again, it looks to me uh, somewhat similar, particularly read in the context of 2.196, uh, as, as something similar to the Nazarite, uh, the Nazarite vow. Uh, a little aside, if I can just add one, one other little detail here. Uh, this is one of four instances in the Quran where the Quran text uses the phrase, Inshallah, if God wills it. Um, it's often struck as rather, as, something as rather strange that if the Quran was the uh, verbatim word of God, that God would use God may well say, if I, if it pleases me, I, I shall do such and such. But it seems rather strange to me that God would actually use this, this common everyday phrase, inshallah, if God wills it. It seems a, a strange thing that God would say that. And it's one of my um, arguments for saying that I don't think that the Quran was ever intended to be uh, read, or at least not all of it was intended to have been read as the uh, verbatim uh, words of, or speech of God. We will also recall that a second part of the Nazarite vow is um, that a person who takes that vow shall abstain from wine and, and strong drink. And of course, it's, uh, it's very well known that the Quran also comes to prohibit the consumption of wine. In the early verses of the Quran, there seems to be a sequence. First of all, it, it praises wine as, as one of the blessings that God as uh, part of God's um, provision for mankind. And then it starts warning um, the Quran audience not to come to prayer when they're drunk or when they're, when they're drinking too much. And then it says um, that it's a bit of a mixed blessing, that in, in wine is, good, is great good and also great wickedness or great uh, danger. And then finally, it comes to the most uh, censorious position. Uh, it says that it's an abomination of Satan. So there is a transition within the Quran from first of all praising wine and then um, urging caution to finally coming to a position of prohibiting the consumption of wine. Um, there's not much in the uh, Jewish scriptures to prohibit drinking of, of wine. Generally speaking, the wine plays a, a, a quite a prominent and high profile role in the, in the Jewish scriptures. Isaiah talks about fine wine and, and, uh, and so on. And it's often seen as being rather odd that the Quran prohibits the consumption of wine on earth, but then promises that people will have wine to drink in paradise. Mm. Uh, some people, um, possibly UJ, may, may regard this as, as a sign of inconsistency or, or, or possibly of hypocrisy or, or saying go without now or trickery, say go without wine now and you'll have more wine in the paradise to come. Uh, I, I, I'm not so. I'm not so sh sure that I take such a cynical view of it. Um, I, I, I think it it could well be, uh, as I say, is a, a sort of imitation of the Nazarite vow that wine is a good thing and you cons and you uh, prohibit the consumption of it now. Um, but it's uh, but one can we can enjoy it later on. I, we've always brought this up. Uh at Speaker's Corner, this came up over and over again, not just wine, but also the covering of women's heads. You have these injunction after injunction, don't drink wine, don't touch wine, not even one drop, because mm -hmm. it's the creation of Satan, and therefore it's prohibitive, uh, prohibitive. But then when you get to chapter 55 and chapter 56 in the Quran, there are rivers of it. You can swim in it. So <laughs> this seeming contradiction uh, with the same thing with women, do not, you know, in chapter 33, right. women are to have their all the, themselves completely covered up except for their eyes and not just the wives of muhammad all believers are to cover themselves all up and 
you have this injunction after injunction not to see your women in public. But then when you get to heaven, there are going to be not not in the Quran, but in the, according to the tradition, there'll be as many as 72 of these women for every man. So mm. what is prohibited here is in abundance there. And that has always been a contradiction here, which is fascinating because what you're bringing up is that this may have something to do with this previous Nazarite injunction. But in this case, there is no Nazaretic injunction against mine. My, is that what you're saying? Um, well, my my conclusion is really a, a question, but is could the author, could the Quran author or the principal Quran author have been modeling his movement on the Nazarite vow uh, in the early stages? Uh, there's no hint of any of this. And as I say, in the early stages, wine is, is praised and promised. Um, but at some stage, um, the Quran author seems to have turned against the consumption of alcohol and i'm wondering from these phrases uh, if he was actually influenced uh, if the shaving of the heads um or the promise that you will shave your heads when you get to um the masjid al-haram is connected with the prohibition of wine and both of them are connected to the nazarite vow and the quran author has come across the nazarite vow and wanted to create something rather similar for himself okay well they're the antecedents and that's what we're looking for so um so there you are, um, shaving of one's head. I regard that as having also now been uh, demonstrated with a, a, not only shaving of one's head in itself, but shaving of one's head at a designated place, at, normally at the temple, um, I think is now uh, substantiated by, by the uh, Nazarite vow. There's only one box is unticked and that's the wearing of garlands so i look forward to the comments it's a bit of a challenge i'll throw that out to anyone if they can find uh find the wearing of garlands in the in the hebrew bible listen thanks so much paul once again you've come back and you've helped us and you've walked us through this whole what we're, what we're calling the jerusalem thesis it's not just jerusalem we're using that city as a designation for the title but you're talking about all these antecedents in this case what you have done and you've gone through a quick overview looking at God's house, you're looking at Bakka, the valley, uh, the, the, the rest stop for Jews, that the Muslims have borrowed all these traditions that are Jewish in nature and have incorporated them into their own, their own practices and their own theology. The cube, the, the Kaaba, the, the, again, you've looked at that antecedent in 1 Kings chapter 6, and also this idea that this is for Abraham, the whole, the whole pre em the emphasis on Abraham. Uh, Mel and I have just put up a video on the whole Abrahamist theme this idea of people being Hagarines and Ishmaelites. So that corresponds exactly to what you're saying here. And then you went into the Hajj. And when you went into the Hajj, you talked about these ceremonies that are per, per, uh, that, that are part and parcel of the Hajj, uh, the, 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 the whole Hajj pilgrimage that Muslims do. Uh, they have animal sacrifices. They do circumambulations. Mm -hmm. These are exactly like what the Jews had done before. There's where the antecedents are. You zero it on shaving of heads, and I like that. And this is this is really good. What what this whole this whole video is about? This episode is about looking at that. Where did that come from? And you note, and you went back to the Nazarite vow. These people that isolated themselves, that they dedicated themselves to God, uh, in Numbers chapter six, verse one to five, and also verse eighteen. And to, to when they started this vow, they would shave their heads, and then when they would end this vow, they would shave their heads so that they could see how much hair had been grown in the intervening period. That has now been incorporated into Islam as they do the Hajj. When they do the Hajj, when they go before they go into Masjid Al Haram, they shave their heads. And here's a picture of them. We'll just put the picture up right at this time so this is not in uh in isolation this is this is well known in jewish circles and you're bringing this up and this is again we're getting back to this thesis upon completion of this uh of this time in a holy place they shave their heads or before they go in you look and also you gave and i thought it was fascinating you also gave the example of paul himself where paul shaved his head in acts 18 uh, he, uh, before he went to Cancria, well, when he was with uh, uh, Apollo and, and Priscilla, or is it Priscilla and Aquila, sorry. And then you went and you showed where these are found in the, in the Quran. And this is the important thing. A lot of people who are watching this may not understand that the Quran is reference after reference. Chapter 2, verse 196, and chapter 48, verse 27 are the two you brought up. These are both specifically looking at a shaving of head that looks almost analogous to what we see in the Jewish uh, 
antecedent, the, the Jewish Nazarite uh, vow. This is the stuff we're looking for. And this is what I want to thank you for. Paul, this is great. I know you've got some others up your sleeve. You've brought in some new ones. We're going to be talking about a large animal next, uh, one of the largest of all animals. And then we're going to also move into the name Muhammad himself. So these are two things that we have to look forward to. People, are you following what Paul's doing? Paul, just be, before we end, um, you have been working quite a few years on this, and you have seen these red flags or these little flags that are coming up, showing that there is a Jewish thesis. When you started um, noticing this, what was it that came to mind in your, in your own thinking concerning why this is so significant? Well, people have known for a very long time, since, since, since the dawn of uh, Islam, people have known that there were similarities be with, between Islam and, the, uh, uh, and, and Judaism, because you, you couldn't read the Quran without noticing that it's got all the Jewish prophets there, and it's got references to, to the Torah and similarities of the laws and, and so on. But it's the connection with the Masjid al-Haram, this, uh, because uh, for the last three, four years, um, since, since watching your video, Mel, uh, I call you Mel, uh, Jay, since watching your video, uh, when, when you're presenting from several years ago, when you're presenting the lack of evidence for anything in Mecca, the, the complete dearth, the desert of evidence for Mecca, and, and then you was looking at what the Quran says about the Masjid al-Haram, and it all seems to fit the Jerusalem, the, the Jerusalem temple. And, uh, and once you see one piece and one piece fits in, and then they all, they all fit in. Everything, everything you look at about the Jerusalem temple, everything you look at about the Masjid al-Haram fits the Jerusalem temple. It's all there. There's nothing that you have to make up, except uh, we still have to do garlands, but nothing that is the Quran says about the Jerusalem temple Nothing that the Quran says about the Masjid al-Haram uh, can't be related to the Jerusalem temple. And once you see one piece, then all the other pieces just seem to fall into place. Okay. It's, it's, uh, there you go. It's exciting. We're coming up to another category that he's going to introduce, a large animal with a large trunk. Uh, you all know what we're talking about. But that's for the next video. God bless you. Thanks so much, Paul. Until we come back again, this is Jay and Paul, 3,000 miles away. Over and out.